Welcome to episode number 333 of Destination Linux. Has it been that many episodes? 333? Feels like 333. Yeah. In this week's episode, Alma Linux is making some waves in the enterprise Linux world. And then we have the Linux desktop market share breaking a new usage barrier, which is very exciting. And then we help out a mate from Australia. Is that how they say it in Australia? Mate? I think you mean mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate from Australia with finding a silent keyboard. Plus, of course, we have our tips, tricks, and software picks coming up for you. My name is Ryan. I'm Michael. And I'm Jill. And if this is your first time with us, Destination Linux is a video podcast about Linux in open source made for all experience levels. Whether you're brand new to Linux or a guru of sudo, this is the podcast for you. So you can come join us on our journey right now to Destination Linux. <laughs> Our community feedback this week comes from Paul. He says, I have a specific hardware question about silent keyboards and mice. My partner has misophonia and the sounds of my keyboard and mouse cause her to stress and leads to issues. I was hoping you could suggest some silent options for a keyboard and mouse. Currently using a Logitech G510 keyboard and a G502 Hero mouse, both of which I am fond of. The mouse is particular in particular fits well in my big hands. He says that he's six five. Me which too. Is, I know we're what on, that's we're like. in this. We're in the same team. I'm six four. So there you go. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking six, for five. <laughs> so that makes sense. Totally. You're, and Jill's you're six all, foot. If you flip those numbers, Ryan, it's correct. So <laughs> <laughs> rude. Um, he goes on to say, I'm looking for options that will work when I am able to move away from Windows. I understand Logitech is not well supported on Linux due to Logitech being less than compatible with their drivers. He says, I also don't really need the G1, 2G, 18 keys that is in the current keyboard that I have, but I do like the light up keys and media controls. I prefer wired input, input devices, but I'm flexible on that. My budget is fa fairly flexible, perhaps around the $200 mark, which is a pretty good number for like pretty much any of these devices. So far, I've only been able to find the Logitech MK295 silent wireless keyboard and mouse combo, but it looks a little small, particularly the mouse. So your suggestions would be much appreciated. Paul from Australia. The timing of this is a little fun because I, brought, I bought a keyboard on Prime Day recently and it has blue switches. And I didn't pay attention to the part of the blue switches. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I saw a mechanical loud. keyboard with uh, onboard macro recording for less than $50. So I got it. And then while I was unboxing it, I pulled out a strip of extra blue switches that you can use to replace things that go bad. And then realized, oh, wait, I have blue switches. I should have probably looked at that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially for doing the shows, you need to have mm. quiet keys. <laughs> Blue is known as being one of the most clicky. Yes. Brown is kind of your because there's there's the quietness of the key, then there's the actuation portion yeah. of it. And your your browns are kind of the middle ground that most people like to utilize, I would say. The majority of people like browns and things. But blue, yes, they're just loud. They're very, very loud. So are you enjoying the loud keyboard though? I mean, some people like that. It's not bad. I still have my old keyboard that has, uh, I think they have reds. They might be browns. And that's fine. And I'm, I can still use the other keyboard. I just saw the option and I wanted to kind of just try it out because it was less than 50 bucks. And that's a pretty good deal. But I also never tried blue switches. So it was kind of like a fun surprise. And <laughs> it's been okay. I mean, they are loud. That is true. And I'm not Usually used to that. But the Amazon package surprise is you forgot what you ordered and then you open up the box and like, oh, surprise. I remember yeah. now what I ordered. That's the <laughs> well, Amazon in, surprise. In my case is, is actually interesting because I got the box, Ryan, and then I opened it the Whoa. same day. Man, life is changing for you over there. I don't even know who you are anymore. <laughs> That's awesome, <laughs> Michael. Know. But it, it's a really interesting question, Jill, because... I don't yeah. really go for the most silent, although I need a quieter keyboard for the podcasting and things. So I usually yeah. go with brown, but there's a different reason here that Paul needs a very different keyboard, something that's completely yes. quiet. And well, you're really the best one here to answer this question, I feel like, because we've learned you have a little bit of a collection. <laughs> yeah, I do. So yeah. So hi, Paul. Thank you so much for writing in. And I do have a few brands and models of keyboards and mice that are extremely quiet that 
might work for you because that has been my goal too as a podcaster to try and find the quietest keyboard. Now I'm more looking for the quietest mechanical via brown switches or red switches, but you need completely silent. And I also have a collection of those kind of keyboards too. So just about any keyboard with low profile scissor switches are extremely quiet and classic membrane keys as, are quiet as well, like the, the ones you find uh, that come standard with Dell machines. Those are pretty quiet. And as we were talking about, mechanical keyboards with brown or red switches are really the quietest for mechanical. So just real quick, Paul, I just wanted to let you know that there will be a lot of links in the show notes for the keyboards Jill's about to mention because she mentioned there's a few models. Well, <laughs> you'll see what she means by a few. <laughs> Give you like a lot of options here, like yes. a lot. A so lot. If everybody else is interested in seeing what the options are as well, they'll be in the show notes too yeah. for you to check out there. And I do want to just mention though, before we move on, that the Logitech thing is an interesting point because mm -hmm. I remember Logitech really being annoying with Linux back in the day. Yeah. Like there were right. problems where it's not that you couldn't use a Logitech mouse. It's just that none of the functionality you could really get to work. But some yeah, of the more advanced feature. mice have a lot of that functionality kind of built into them by default. So you can do most of the settings on the mouse itself. And so I guess I haven't ran into it. And one of the other things I've noticed is the battery. Like I have a wireless Logitech mouse status notifications and things actually show up in the indicator panels now. So when I go into settings and stuff, it tells me what the battery life of my Logitech mouse is. So there's some integrations getting better, um, but I wouldn't write off Logitech entirely because I think they make some of the best mice out there for you to utilize. Not that they're the only ones. There are other fantastic uh, mice options as well, but I do really like the Logitech. In fact, when Michael was on the hunt for one recently... That's what I recommended. And that's what I got. The G502 yeah. Lightspeed. Nice. There you go. Lightspeeds are great. I didn't even know that there was an option between different G502s. That's just. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I went with the G903, which is obviously 400% better than what you got, Michael. But that's really cool that you got the fifth generation. Because of the number difference? Is that right? That's <laughs> all. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, like Ryan was saying, really all the latest Logitech keyboards and mice I've used work great on Linux. And they even often say on the, on the Amazon descriptions, Linux or Chrome OS support in the description. So we have come a long way. And like Ryan was saying, some of the older models had some special keys that wouldn't work on Linux, but that has pretty much changed. And a lot of that has to do with the community uh, developing drivers for Logitech and them being included in the in the latest Linux kernels. So that's been really sweet. And even this little, this is a little mini wireless one I am using uh, right now. And initially it didn't work on Linux. This one is, is about 15 years old. <laughs> By the way, for those not watching the video, of course it's pink in case yeah. anybody <laughs> was pink one. wondering. It's very important you clarify that, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this one is, is actually clicky and works great for my small hands, but they also have a uh, silent and larger options as well. And there's a wireless keyboard and mouse combo I have used many times before that I linked also in the show notes that works really well. That's that um, is a, is around forty four dollars and ninety nine cents, and is around the same price range as the one you were looking at, Paul. So that's really cool. And I have another one of my favorite silent keyboard and mice wireless options, and it comes in either a full size or seventy five percent keyboard at around twenty to thirty bucks. Pretty. <laughs> okay, so this is interesting. I've seen this keyboard in the stores. It's got the circular keys. Yes. So it's more like a typewriter feel to it. Yes. So mm -hmm. if you like that old school look of typewriter and the very yellow play school coloring, yes. then this is the perfect <laughs> keyboard for you. Well, and I, also you have to love the googly eyes. <laughs> yes. Did you put googly eyes well, on that, Jill, or did it come with googly eyes? <laughs> No, the, those are B stickers. I have a, a yellow. <laughs> it doesn't look uh, googly eyes, though. I have a yellow uh, Linux rig that I themed to be. Of course you. Do. So I wanted a yellow, <laughs> yellow mouse and keyboard. And what I like about these ones is they're scissor switches. So yeah, and and the nice. mouse is actually really nice. I was impressed. It might be a little small for your hands, but you know you can use another 
uh, mouse with this keyboard. Well, I'm sure and out they, of our tens of thousands of listeners, there's uh, probably 50% of them need a yellow keyboard to match their yellow rig too. So yeah. this could be very <laughs> I have a very unique yellow rig. In fact, there. someday yeah. I need to show that. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, really treasure cool. Treasure hunt, I'm hearing. Yes. That's what I'm hearing. In fact, it's behind me. You can see a little bit of oh, yellow. I see a little out. sneak peek of that there. Yeah. yeah. Well, you got to watch the video version of this show too. <laughs> yes. Time. So, and that brand is S-U-P-E-R-B- CCO. All their keyboards, I have several different colors. I have a purple set and I have a light pink set. They all work uh, work great and are very silent. And um, also a jelly comb. My husband, who has large hands, likes his jelly comb wireless silent keyboard and mouse, which is also linked in the show notes. And they also have, have the full-size version of the keyboards as well as the minis. And they're around $35.00 to thirty nine dollars, very inexpensive. I I tried nice. to to stay in the in a lower budget because in case it doesn't work for you, Paul, you can buy another one and not go over your two hundred dollars. This limit. is why it's better to get hardware recommendations from Jill because anything I would have mentioned would have been like. So if you spend three hundred dollars on a keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> and what you're going to get is the same functionality as the $30 keyboard, but with $300 price tag. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it'll probably be a ducky. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to recommend the ducky <laughs> for everyone else. It's the ducky. It, and the other brand I'm going to um, recommend is Rocat. Rocat makes great membrane silent keyboards and mice with RGB. Mm-hmm. And they're... And, I linked a keyboard in the show notes that is currently $29.99 on Amazon. And uh, they have have a really active community of Linux users who make drivers for all their devices. So yep. that really comes in handy. And make sure, Paul, to search in the Amazon comments for Linux or Ubuntu compatibility. I do this before I buy any new piece of hardware for Linux to see if it has been tested on Linux by other users. So that, that's a that's, great tip. And also the mm-hmm. fact that you just mentioned like search for Linux or Ubuntu yes. is a good point because I did I always <laughs> search for Linux, but I never think about Ubuntu. And sometimes people just put Ubuntu instead of Linux because it's so popular, you know? Exactly. Exactly. A little bit about my keyboard and mice collection. As I have several oh, hundred. Joe, we're going to have to cut you off, okay? There's no more keyboard talk. You're at your max now. At, uh, <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Tell us about your keyboard. I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> we have to stop Jill. She literally got sad. No, she literally got sad. sad. I feel bad. She was like, really? I can't talk about my other keyboard? I know. I actually <laughs> took you seriously. <laughs> I could do a whole treasure hunt just on, on keyboards. And I have in the past. You know, uh, I have several hundred keyboards and mice in my collection, both new and vintage that I use. A, a few of them have been featured on my Jill's treasure hunt. In, in on Destination Linux number 233 and Destination Linux 254. And I have vintage ones and uh, newer ones. And in fact, I frequently change out keyboards on a weekly basis to give them lots of love. And I'm always lo- on the lookout for the best keyboards and mice that fit my small hands that are quiet for podcasting and match my pink gaming rigs. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> this oh, one I use. Like a similar one to the yellow, but pink. Yes. Yep. <laughs> so this one I use to do my show notes on, on my Steam Deck. <laughs> it's nice. both Bluetooth and, but I, I use it on the Steam Deck with a USB gondol, dongle. Gondol. No. <laughs> I like gondols too, but Sorry. dongles. I'm used Gondolas to. are great, you know. Gondolas, Gondolas are, are wonderful. great. Yeah. Yeah. But this one, what I love about it is it it has compatibility, again, with the USB uh, wireless, as well as uh, two Bluetooth inputs. So this this one's nice. And I use this one also for testing out, uh, uh, testing distros on different computer rigs, because it's just... You know, just plug in the wireless adapter and you're good to go, or Bluetooth. (laughs) I love how Jill said... (laughs) That she switches out keyboards to give them different, give them love, as if the keyboards feel like they're being dis- discarded. And- He's assigned yeah. feelings to each of the keyboards, but Michael, <laughs> you've got to stop prompting Jill. She will not stop. Yes, on the keyboards. So, thank you, Jill, for the seventy recommendations that you've provided. There's plenty of more <laughs> behind me. 
Thank you we so know. much, Paul, <laughs> for writing us. Although in the future, I will be very cautious when it comes to hardware uh, questions to uh, <laughs> let Jill take those questions. <laughs> if you that. ask for a recommendation, <laughs> she will have a thousand or two. <laughs> Which is a good thing. And depending yeah. on how long the show goes, well, <laughs> not, we might not have time. <laughs> Oh, they're making fun of me, everyone. <laughs> no. No. In the most, in the most loving way. I know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> this episode of Destination Linux is sponsored by Linbit. Linbit has been keeping digital businesses running for over 20 years. They're the makers of open source products like DRBD, which is high availability software that has been part of the Linux kernel since 2010, and LinStore, industry-leading open source software-defined storage. Linbit has an active presence in the open source community and they collaborate with the community to help identify and build new features. Linbit provides enterprise grade software that runs on a variety of platforms and OSs without vendor lock-in. What that means is, is that you could choose the software on any platform, including specific hardware that you want to use or just off the shelf hardware that you get and connect it. You get, all of this stuff can be interchanged really easily. And with DRBD and LinStore, you can have high speed replicated block storage in almost any configuration, whether it's Kubernetes, Apache Cloud, or Open Nebula. There's even DRBD proxy for long distance replication. Linbit is run by its founders to this day, and all of its engineers and developers are in house with offices in Europe and North America which allows them to have global 24-7 support to complement their enterprise offerings. Visit linbit.com to learn more about the people behind Linbit and the awesome software for block storage, duplication, and more. So we did it, everyone. We did it. What? Linux has broken the 3% desktop market share barrier. They say it's Yay! Yes, 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 yes. yes. 3%. <laughs> 3 percent lot. I know <laughs> it sounds really low. You're like 3%. But when you add in the fact that we don't have much data on Linux at all, and that we've had this problem forever that we've been dealing with with Linux of, you know, how much percentage do we actually have and some of the numbers in the past, it shows we're making progress. The 3% yeah. is a big barrier. Absolutely. Next, 99%. But we'll start exactly. with 3%, exactly. and that's pretty awesome. So it's kind of been all over the news, people talking about the 3%, because it's a big deal to make an, you know, a little bit of a penetration in this market with operating systems, which doesn't change very often. Yeah, exactly. And you know, it would be easier to quantify how many Linux users there really are if data collection or telemetry <laughs> was being yeah. done by these different distros and projects. Oh, but cool. Based on the coverage of the Fedora topic we did last week about them adding ethical data collection and the feedback we got, well, uh, we will probably never really know for sure because some people seem to be slightly or maybe the more accurate way of saying that is vehemently opposed to this. <laughs> yeah, this is true. The other thing that they cannot track Linux, one of the reasons is that it's, st it's honestly sneaker net. It's, you know, people download it you know, put it on a flash drive or old school, burn it to a live CD or DVD and give it to a friend. And you can't track that. <laughs> so I used to if do it with my students. If you have data collection built into it, you could. Yes, yeah, you once could. It goes and online, that's, right. that, that, that's what needs to change. If that changes, then we can track right. this better. You can write Jill, who is for telemetry, at <laughs> sending a email to us yeah. on our website, touchdigital.com. <laughs> Note, that was not Ryan this time. For all of those that always blame me for everything, that was not Ryan that said that. It was Jill. Yeah. Be clear. Don't send your email <laughs> talking about how Ryan loves telemetry. It was Jill. Jill, just be clear, everyone. All right. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, this is a big deal. It is a big deal when you look at the fact that we're growing and not shrinking. Number one, that's a very important part of this. So we're hitting new barriers going the right direction. And it's a big deal because this isn't something that changes much. The question is, that why did this happen? Like, what are some of the things that are driving it? Is it because the Raspberry Pi? Is it because of the Steam Deck? Probably. Or maybe all the cool stuff mm -hmm. Pine64 is doing? Yeah, maybe. Or my personal belief, just because I want it to be this, because I love it so much, is it's the new framework laptop. And even though it's not out, yes. it's driven the 3% because it's so freaking awesome. And <laughs> that's, that is a very impressive thing to do to yeah. drive 
traffic with a the month new ago. Framework 16, because well, technically there are frameworks out there, but the new framework 16, well, let me tell you all about it. I'm going to pull a Jill. So the framework 16. Oh, <laughs> well, all we know right now is that Linux is moving on up. Oh gosh, Michael, please. I might, I might put like a Jefferson's music. I was going to say, you got to do that. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But just to be clear about something, we're talking about the desktop market, the market share for, you know, operating systems on a desktop. We're not talking about Linux market share as a whole or just computing as a whole, because to quickly take take a step back, Linux is the most dominant operating system on and off the planet. Linux powers 100% of all the top supercomputers. It's used in the it's the most used kernel in smartphones due to Android. Linux is easily the dominant force in servers and data centers and all that. And the list just goes on and on. Linux is even powering the International Space Station and the Raffle Copter on the recent Mars rover. I like to call it the rolling on floor laughing copter. Exactly. <laughs> the year of the Linux has already happened many many years ago. Linux desktop. Well, that's a different story, I guess. Yeah, Linux is the most used operating system in the world. It's just the desktop that we're talking about. Well, I think it gets more interesting (laughs) the more we look at this. So on the onset, 3%, right? But let's look at what's happened to the market share. So in June of 2022, so we're going to compare year over year here. We're going to start in June 2022. Windows enjoyed a 76% share of the desktop market. Those poor suffering Mm -hmm. users. Yeah. Linux had just a 2.4% share and Chrome OS had a 1.7% and Mac had about 15% of the market there. So really your two biggest contenders were Windows and, and Mac. Linux was only at 2% and Chrome OS was catching up fast to Linux there. Mm. So now if we fast forward to June of 2023, Windows dropped to 68%. That's an eight point drop. And decline from Windows users. And really, that's very interesting to me because this is Windows 11 territory. A lot of people getting new laptops now with Windows 11 by default, experiencing Windows 11 for the first time. And Windows 11 had incredible innovations like the menu in the middle of the screen, which has never (laughs) been done before. (laughs) Linux rises to 3% or rises about a half a point. So it gains half a point of the market from that eight point decline. Chrome OS went up to 4.13% or 2.4 point increase, which I'm counting Chrome as Linux. Chrome OS is Linux. I'm going to just go ahead and put those two together there and say that's a win for all of us. It totally is if you think about it because Chrome OS is based on Linux. So, yeah. Right. It's kind of like if you're going to use Android, then you've got to use Chrome OS too in that same thing. That's true. And as I talked about on the Das Geek YouTube channel, if you use Chrome OS... It really becomes actually a useful operating system the moment you enable the Linux portion. Yeah, after of it. you tweak it and make it less of Chrome OS and more Linux. <laughs> yeah, and they've made that easier because they know that too, right? There's only so many web apps that are going to work really well for the desktop user. So they've made enabling the Linux uh, in there to install apps and things on your Chromebooks easier and easier and easier. Uh, as they went along. It used to be you'd have to go in these developer options and reboot and do all this stuff. Now you just click a button in the settings to to turn that stuff on. So they know it too. But Mac OS went up to 21% of the market or a six point increase. So Mac still took the majority of the share. And well, I'm not surprised by that at all. The The reality is the new silicon that Mac has is some of the best hardware um, that's we've seen across anybody. I know a lot of people just puked right now and threw up or spit their coffee out. But look, we got called spade a spade. I mean, it's, it's yeah. dang good hardware. You got to so, be upfront about the fact that if you've used yeah. it before, you use like the M1 or the M2 and stuff like that. It is impressive for what you can do with, with that kind of laptop, right? So in terms of understanding where it's coming from, I get it. There, There's not a lot of innovation in the PC world and there is some in Apple. So I get why people would be using Apple stuff. Yeah. And Apple as well has made things easy with UTM to get Linux to run really well within there. So you can use your virtual machines and stuff. And I'm not trying to uh, necessarily uh, talk about how great Mac OS is. That's not the point of this, but I'm just trying to explain why they probably seen a six point increase there. You've got a lot of developers going there and Windows 11 clearly is not what 
they intended for it to become of, of gaining popularity or bringing people over. Like uh, maybe one of my favorites of Windows, because there were really good Windows back in the day, like 7 was amazing. I really loved Windows 7 so, at the end, not at the very beginning. NT 4.0 rocked. <laughs> yeah. I think that we should be pouncing on this right now as soon as possible, as fast as we can, because Windows 12 will probably be better. It'll probably be decent, because if you think about it, it's literally every other release. Every single time they make a release, yeah. it is either good or awful, and we just got the awful so they might learn from it again, and we don't want to wait another seven years to get the next opportunity. Would you just forget our last episode last week where we talked about there's probably not going to be a Windows 12? But they said that five years ago, and then 11 came out. Yeah, <laughs> true. True. And based on this percentage of drop, they may be like, you know what? We're going to release a Windows 12 after all. They seem to be focused in other areas right now. Obviously, AI is a big focus for them, and and. Oh, yeah. All of the software and cloud things that they're doing, which leverage Linux very heavily on their Azure platform and everything else. But uh, their desktop is certainly losing space. And that's allowing competition to open up here. And the interesting thing about that for me is when the kids start utilizing, I mean, the companies know this very well. Google's probably one of the done one of the best at this is if they can get the kids to start utilizing this in schools, utilizing your operating system and things in schools and get familiar with it. That's going to what they want to use when they go to college. That's going to be what they want to use when they go into the workplace and the workplaces yep. will adopt to that. And so they're looking long term. They've been looking long term by focusing so heavily on the educational institutions. I think Linux could obviously do some more work there as well. But in some ways, like I said, Chrome OS is kind of bringing Linux to the masses there, especially when the kids want to do something other than web apps, probably going to go enable Linux in the Chromebook and start utilizing that some more. But Mac's really the big contender here. I think their share gain of six points, Microsoft loses eight, they gain six. That's something. That's pretty impressive. I mean, also, Apple has pretty good marketing. So there's that too. Yeah. Well, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens going forward. But I think this is great news because we're looking at a situation where Linux has not been you know, more than 3%, I think, ever. And if you count Chrome OS, which I do, that's a 7% market share. Yeah. And that is fantastic. And I think it's only going to get better from here because of the innovations that don't exist in Windows and the ones that do exist in Linux are just getting better and better. Raspberry oh. Pis are coming yeah. back in stock. That's yeah. going to be awesome. Grow it. Yes. Steam Deck keeps getting better with the every Steam iteration. Steam Deck is getting so much attention. I, mm -hmm. I love this. And it's also kind of proof that Linux can be a, a product for an everyday user. Now, it might need to be tweaked to a specific use case, but people have been dropping down to the desktop and using it as a computer as well and not having any big deal about it. And that shows that you could totally do it. And if a product like maybe a laptop was focused around doing the same thing, we could have an awesome offering to, you know, the market. Yeah. You know what? As I as we're talking about this, I'm realizing, well, you know, Raspberry, the Raspberry Pi and Chromebooks are the two most sold devices in the world. Why isn't this number higher? You know, yeah. seriously, I mean, what's going on here? Because the way they're taking their telemetry. No telemetry, just, maybe? Yeah. That's that was thing. Jill that just said that, by the way, not Ryan. That was not Ryan. Jill. Was Jill said that. I was. Just I've always found that very that. interesting. You know, it's it, well, it's the number like, that we have right now that we're talking about is the number that we can actually quantify. Yeah. But the actual yeah. number of Linux is, is definitely higher. A lot it might higher. be double. It might be triple. We have no idea. We could be bigger than it's Mac OS and not even know it. Yeah. yeah. The exactly. Vehemently. Yes. Opposed absolutely. to any type of telemetry at all, no matter how ethical it is. Jill, why do you keep bringing that up? This oh, is Ryan yeah. talking why right now. I keep bringing it up, well, Jill. I mean, we're we're moving on. <laughs> the Internet of Things devices, you know, in our modems, you know, people have to access their modems to get to to get on the Internet. And it's running Linux. You know? <laughs> oh so, Jill, do you think that people need to change their opinions on telemetry? Yeah. Yes, I totally do, Ryan. <laughs> telemetry is the future. Thank you, Jill. Thank you for that. That's I don't necessarily agree with that, Jill, but that's a really interesting take. Telemetry is the future. 
<laughs> I love how you you use your mixer to pretend to be Jill, and she just says it for you. <laughs> she just does it anyways. Yeah. No, we are tr- truly, we're joking, by the way, for anybody in there, <laughs> partly at least, that, you know, there I mean, is there is some, a little bit yeah. of truth to it. There's like there's a yeah. truth that, kernel of truth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get one, Michael. <laughs> well done. Well done. But there is some truth that we're missing on that. But you know what? It also makes me think Windows is fat and bloated, not P H A T fat, but just F A T fat and bloated with yeah. the fat, fat 32. To, fat 32. Yeah. <laughs> man, your dad jokes are on fire today, man. <laughs> <laughs> fire, fire. Um, and, and that's actually holding Windows back as well, because all the automation devices, Raspberry Pi, all of this stuff is really kind of taking off in the market. Home automations that people are doing. You can't put Windows in these devices. You can't even put a shrunken down version of Windows. They've tried that, what they call it, Windows SE or something. It was terrible. CE, oh, so yeah. something like that. CE, yeah. oh, so bad. They used to call it so, Wince. <laughs> yeah. It's That's, terrible. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> I love it. This is terrible. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity here. This is exciting news. I hope it continues. We get more uh, percentage of the market share that's pure Linux in there. Chrome OS is all right, but pure Linux in there. And that's, uh, but that's good. We got 3%. We'll take that's a little good. pat on our back. It's because of this show. You're welcome. Yes, we totally did it. Yeah. <laughs> Alma Linux recently announced in their Future of Alma Linux blog post something big when it comes to how they are going to be handling the changes made by Red Hat to access the RHEL source code. Alma Linux is choosing to diverge a little from the previous goal of being one-to-one or bug-to-bug compatible as a clone of RHEL to now being a ABI compatible goal, which is, of course, as we all know, ABI stands for Application Binary Interface. Michael, Michael, Michael. Let's tell people what it really means. Like, I mean, that what, is what it means, technically. Yes, but what does it mean? What does that real? What does that mean? You're going to have Appli- to break it down a little bit. <laughs> application <laughs> binary interface. It means they're no longer trying to be a direct copy of RHEL, but instead be based on RHEL, while also making sure that the applications are compatible with RHEL and they'll continue to work on Alma Linux this entire time. And... They have some flexibility now to take some of these actions, such as fixing bugs that they find in Red Hat and stuff beforehand and submitting those. They can submit those still to Red Hat and stuff, but they can take some different directions from the the main source there. So that's what that ABI is supposed to represent. Ah, So not a one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. But application binary interface. Sure. That's what it means. Yes. As we all know. It's very telling. (laughs) But what does this mean for all my Linux users? Is this the end? Is this the end as we know it? <laughs> it basically means nothing. If you're using Alma Linux today, just keep using it and enjoy it. But I still think it's some interesting news, which we'll get into here in a second. Uh, especially it's interesting for enterprise users. So if you're oh, a regular yeah. user at home, it's not nothing's going to change for you. But if you're enterprise Linux, then this may create some differences in what you experience with Alma Linux, right? It could be a change in the sense of like, you're not going to have exact bug to bug. So if you you might have a bug that's in Alma Linux that is not necessarily in the uh, rail version, but that also doesn't mean that they're going to be that much different. It's like a slight difference because they've already said that they're going to be keeping the ABI compatibility, which means that it's for the most part, it's going to be completely compatible as far as the applications you want to use. And that's the whole point of this anyway. But having a little bit of flexibility, a little bit of openness in terms of like the direction they want to go rather than being stuck with the idea of being like an exact copy, which when your goal is to be a copy, like other ones have said, there's not much for you to do in that. You know, there's not, you really can't go any for any way farther than just being a copy. So I think this is interesting in that sense. And some of the other rail clones out there are trying to stay as is with like relying on a path that some have described as a gray area, like maybe even loopholes people have described, like Rocky Linux, for example. And I guess that's kind of fair considering a lot of people are arguing that what Red Hat did is also a loophole. So, you know, Uh, others have said stuff about being hard forking, uh, keep compatibility with rail, which that was SUSE. And that doesn't make any sense at all. And for those who are curious, uh, Sousa did update their blog post, but I wanted to put that in there because I do have a video on my YouTube channel that explains what a hard fork is. So maybe Sousa should check that out before they do their next blog post. Then there's others 
that have fired across the bow of Red Hat, claiming to be open source code crusaders of sorts. Well, this claiming I mean, to all is fair in war. Like to me, Rel made a move. Other people are responding to it. And some of those responses are more aggressive than others. But look, Rel's move wasn't exactly non-aggressive. I mean, it was an aggressive move. I'm not, That's we fair. talked about it, agree with it, or not agree with it entirely. I don't agree with the move they made with CentOS originally, but sure, exactly. this particular move based on some things that happened kind of makes sense to me. Not going to get into it again, open that can of worms, but... <laughs> You know, all these other people reacting to it, Rel has to expect that people aren't just going to sit there and do nothing. 100% you know? sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I completely agree. And I think the way that Sousa handled it, it was kind of odd to see, but also fair. It's a competitive market. Do what you need to do. However, this claim about being the code crusaders is not what I'm talking about with Sousa. This is a claim that is coming from Oracle, which absolutely is hilarious because it is nonsense in my opinion. For those that don't know, Oracle is the company that bought Sun Microsystems and then killed OpenOffice and proceeded to sue Google with the hope to get as much money as possible, regardless of consequences, which the consequences of them winning their case would have been the destruction of modern programming by causing APIs to become proprietary assets and thus needlessly complicating computing for everyone on the planet. But uh, yeah. Everything, I mean, in your opinion, everything changes, <laughs> Michael. You know, like Microsoft used to hate Linux. Now they love Linux. Oracle may have made some bad decisions in the past, but now they are the open source champions we've all been waiting for. They are Braveheart. Highly They're Mel unlikely. Gibson with face paint on and a kilt. Highly unlikely, uh, but I appreciate where you're going with that. But Alma, back to Alma. Alma has been, to me, like the saint in this whole story. So whether you agree with what Rel did, you're on the fence with what Rel did, you hate what Rel did, Alma's just been first class this entire time. Their blog posts have been first class. The people we've talked to within Alma have been first class about this. And as somebody who spent 20 some years in leadership, you realize through that time that true leaders emerge not during the easy times, but during the most difficult times. And this is certainly a difficult time with companies like Alma. And when you look at how Alma has handled this, everything they do has just shown that they want to partner with Red Hat. They want to help promote this ecosystem along with Red Hat. They even talk about, hey, we've had to make this change, but don't worry, we're still going to submit bug fixes and upstream patches and everything to Red Hat. So they, they're like wanting to get closer to Red Hat with this to help them in some ways, but also making sure they're protecting their own asset here by not enforcing this one-to-one -one compatibility, which also, by the way, means that, yes, there may be bugs in Alma that aren't in RHEL, but vice versa as well. There may be bugs in RHEL that aren't in Alma because of this, because they're not forcing yeah, that one-to-one. -one. Exactly. If I was a company and I was looking across the landscape and for whatever reasons, RHEL was not something that I wanted to deploy into my enterprise, Alma would be the thing I would be looking at because they've just handled this masterfully, in my opinion. Yeah, I also think the way that they structure their organization is also nice because it is a, a nonprofit and it is backed by a company, but let's face it, the entire existence of Linux has been backed by companies. So there's a lot of people who are anti-corporation. And I thought that was kind of funny because we did get some comments about how, um, you know, corporations are ruining Linux. And really, corporations is what built Linux because someone has to pay for the developers to do the work. And I know that are, there's a really... -uh. I, <laughs> I know there's a really common misconception that is spread about how Linux is made by volunteers and their spare time and stuff like that. For the majority of the time, that is not the case. There are people who do that, yes, and that's great. I love the fact that people are participating and working on these various distros and working on various projects. It's, it's amazing. But the general sense is that there's at least, you know, three times, four times as many people who are being paid to work on it than they're doing in their spare time. By the way, if that was Michael talking, not Ryan. So if you disagree <laughs> with that comment, go to tuxdigital.com and write an email to Michael. Whereas Ryan, on the other hand, would say, 
I agree, Michael, that the corporations provide a ton of the code, even contributions to the kernel itself. And without them, Linux would be nowhere near where it is today. And a lot of the people who work on some of these projects do so being employed with one of these open source companies that also give them some time to work on side projects and other things as well. But there are a ton of volunteers that just do this without any of that. And they're awesome I and amazing. Yeah. And and I really am upset that you put all of those people down, Michael. And <laughs> yeah. this is Ryan. So if you want to send praise I love to Ryan, go <laughs> <so laughs> <prefacing laughs> this to completely. You're just, you're just stacking content. the load on your thumb. And <laughs> tell like Ryan how you appreciate his support of the open source community there. But <laughs> here, I want to talk about a quote from Alma Linux just to kind of demonstrate their class. They say, while all these changes open up a lot of opportunities, we want to be clear about the fact that we are still dedicated to being good open source citizens. We'll continue to contribute upstream in Fedora and CentOS stream and to the greater enterprise Linux ecosystem, just as we've been doing since our inception. And we invite our community to do the same. First class. Awesome. Just absolutely first class. The whole I agree. Love and it. and wasn't that the feeling you got from them at at the Southern California Linux Expo m- meeting the developers of all Yes. That was yeah, their enthusiasm, Absolutely. their excitement and you know, contributing upstream. It's just it's part of their DNA and it shows. And I think this move from Alma Linux is awesome and in many ways this will progress the Alma Linux ecosystem as a whole. I think this is a good move for them. And uh, if, you know, you would like to help them out, you can join the Alma Linux OS Foundation or become a sponsor on GitHub or Open Collective or report bugs. They need lots of bug triage as well. Help. (laughs) Yeah. I think that's probably one of the big things that they really need right now, too, that they're moving away from that one-to-one compatibility is people to help out there. So, hey, if you're... Whether you're for or against the rel thing, Alma is doing some great things there. So consider getting with them and, and helping out there. So, Jill. Yes. Do you like pinball? Have you ever played pinball machine? Yes. <laughs> I, I've spent probably hundreds of hours at pinball machines in the arcades in the 1970s and 1980s. <laughs> and wow. in fact, this week's game is absolutely pincredible. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> that's the name of the game, Pincredible. <laughs> Pincredible is a really fun twist on pinball games. Completely flips the playbook for pinball games. Instead of playing pinball, you are now a pinball architect who creates pinball layouts, trying mm. to outsmart the Automata pinball wizard bot. And the current version is being released as early access and is fully a fully playable tutorial of the game. And depending on early access feedback and wish lists and other input from the community, the plan is to create a more complete version of the game for after early access. And Pincredible is a lot of fun and supports the Steam Deck and our Linux Penguins out of the box. And it will also give you a new appreciation on the work that goes into creating an old fashioned IRL pinball game, my favorite kind. So I've got to be honest here. I never understood pinball machines when I was a kid. Like that was the last type of arcade that, you know, I had a limited Uh. set of quarters that I was going to use. And pinballs always seem like you play for 10 seconds because I wasn't good at it. Well, you play for 10 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Play for 10 (laughs) seconds. Your ball falls into the hole. You lose your quarter and now you put another quarter in. I'm like, but over there I get a joystick and graphics and characters like ripping each other's rib cages out, Mortal Kombat and stuff like that. That's way more fun than a pinball. But then... Now, later in life, I have a friend who collects pinball machines, has a whole house full of them. I think they have like eight or ten of these and even buy these new ones that come out. And they're so passionate about it, these machines. Yes. About the intricate details and and all of the different mechanics and things that go into the various sets of these pinball machines. And it started to make a little more sense to me of why people love this. Now, don't get me wrong. I still don't like pinball machines to go spend my money on, but I can appreciate it a little more. I but love you know, how you grew up t- to learn to love it because your friend has them and you get to play for free. Yeah, that's right. really nice. Naturally. Yeah. That's really and nice. And then 
I remember the one thing I really liked with pinball because it didn't cost me quarters was the shareware version of pinball like 3D. Yes. That came out for a long time around the Wolfenstein and Doom age yeah, where it was on floppy yeah, yeah. disk and it was really beautiful graphics. And the one that comes with Windows a long time ago? Yeah. You know? that Probably. I think it came with Windows too, but I just remember on the shareware disk that people would have and it was just a really cool game and didn't cost a quarter and, you know, you could get your two shift keys where your paddles and things, but yeah, it's pretty cool. This is neat. This is a neat concept of building a pinball machine because there's so much... Uh, yeah. architecture and engineering that goes into these yeah. machines are quite amazing. Really amazing. It's pretty interesting because I've never even thought about the complexity it would require you to build a pinball layout to make sure that it's a, a very difficult ver game, but also something that can be done. And because you then have to build it out like a physical version of it and put it in an arcade and all that stuff. So the layout you just choose, you know, has to be well thought out, you know? Yeah. They need a Linux pinball machine. Yeah, absolutely. You, know, that you hit different keystrokes and it gets you in a pseudo command and then opens up different secret areas <laughs> yeah. of the pinball machine. Like I'm giving away a free million dollar idea here to somebody, but you know, it's all looks like a terminal. You're welcome people. Yeah. Yeah. You're <laughs> welcome people. And, and the, uh, the big, uh, oh, the big goal would be uh, cat proc pinball. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> and, <laughs> You know, the other thing about that is the one thing I learned about pinballs through my friend is there are secret modes that you unlock in pinball machines. So yes. there's a lot of the secret stuff. So the game on the onset, what you see isn't always there. There's these secret modes that if you hit certain things in certain sequences that it, you know, will change the whole dynamic of the game. And there's so much to pinball. I did there, not know that at all. Oh, yes. yeah, there is absolutely. Actually, uh, a dear friend of mine has has one of the very early uh, Star Trek pinballs. And he's yeah, been, cool. he hired someone to come in and, and, and fix it. And it's working now. And that is just so much to, to so much fun to play. And uh, I, I remember one of the, the Easter eggs in it is you you get to hear Leonard Nimoy say, uh, logical. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Now, are the flappers for the Star Trek pinball machine lightsabers? No. <laughs> no, wrong job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wrong uh, I just universe. universally made yeah. everyone Everyone mad. is now mad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, our software spotlight's not as exciting as a pinball machine, but it's very, very cool here. In fact, you heard me do sound effect earlier. No, you didn't. That was Jill for real. But <laughs> maybe <was> <laughs> it was a sound effect that I was doing earlier. But there's a cool tool called James DSP. And so that's our software spotlight. James DSP for Linux was created by a guy named Tom. So figure that one <laughs> out yeah. there. Uh, this is a Linux port of a project called James DSP, originally created for Android devices by a guy named James. That's James, James Fung, James <laughs> Fung Jr. You guys remember the James Bond Jr. cartoon? Or no. James, what? James Bond, James Bond Jr. You don't remember that? Uh, no, I don't remember that. No. Jill? Uh -uh. No? Oh, maybe it's all on my head. Maybe it doesn't even exist. All right. So <laughs> James DSP for Linux is an open source sound effects app for Pipewire and Pulse Audio. So let's say you want to add some reverb to your voice or maybe add compression. You could do that. Or you could do what Michael and I did and start multiple podcasts, spend years creating content for basically free, and then eventually creating a large enough audience to start selling advertising in which then you could buy some prosumer equipment and just hit the button and do stuff like this. But... You could also just use the software for completely free and get the same thing. You could thing. just use so, the yes. software instead of <laughs> yeah. So install James DSP. It's very cool there. You've got automatic bass boost, equalizer, surround sound effects, and so much more. Utilizing Pipewire, which is freaking amazing. We've talked about that so much and all the amazing work that goes into Pipewire. So check it out. James DSP. Yeah, and I really enjoyed testing this app while playing back the last episode of Destination Linux on, on YouTube. And Michael and Ryan actually sound really cool with lots of reverb in their voices. <laughs> so you, you're nice. saying we sound better if you modify our voices, that they don't sound that good now. Oh, I do like your voices. So oh, they, thanks, Jill. But it was just fun Sweet. to make them sound wacky. I wasn't <laughs> like how you didn't compliment. prompt that at all, Ryan. Yeah. No, I wasn't that bitching at for compliments. No, but not at all. what I also liked about uh, James DSP is it has a bypass power button 
which you can turn it on, on and off. And this is handy to turn on or off the effect from whatever you're listening to easily. So you oh, don't nice. have to like exit the app to turn off the features, yeah. which is really nice. And also there is a Pulse Audio version of James DSB uh, that I installed on one of my older machines. And I've actually been using Pulse Effects for Pulse Audio for years. And it's awesome and very powerful, but James DSP has an easier to use interface. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. I like that power off function too, because yeah, I tend cool. to go into these apps and just click on everything because yes. I can't help myself. And then I'm like, that's, that's yeah. terrible. <laughs> Let me just turn that off and start over. So, yeah. Nice. So, hey, Ryan, are you using Wayland or X right now? I only use Wayland. Wayland for life. <laughs> Wait, no, I just did an X. X. X for life. life. <laughs> Wayland for life. Well, okay. Ryan seems to be confused about what he's using. I'm currently using Wayland right now. And the tip of this week is a quick command to let you see which one you're running. So this can be important for potential compatibility with software. Like some software works better in X, others better in Wayland. Some doesn't work at all in Wayland yet, and others have stopped supporting X already. So this is why you would might, might need to know this. And all you need to do is run this simple command, the word echo, then a space, and then a dollar sign, and then to indicate it's a variable. And now everything after this point is all capitalized. So you would do capital XDG underscore session underscore type. And there you have it. And if you, you have a tip enter? for us, do what? You hit enter? I mean, you also... That's how commands work, right? You didn't say you had to hit enter. <laughs> so I was lost. That I is typed how all commands this in, work in the terminal, Ryan. And okay, for those happening. who don't know, you hit enter, you hit enter. <laughs> yes. So, fair enough. If you're brand new to the show, you know, that you, or you might, that might be a thing. Yeah, a new so, uh, beginner. If you, yeah. Exactly. I mean, if you're brand new to Linux in general, yeah. Yeah. If you're so, brand new to computers and have never used one before. <laughs> if you don't know what enter key, key is, that it says the word enter on it and you just press it. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Now that now it's helpful. Perfect. If you have a tip yeah. for us that you want to share with the rest of the community, then please send it in at tuxdigital.com slash contact, or you can get in touch on our Discord server at tuxdigital.com slash Discord. You know someone's going to send an email that says, hit the enter key after commands to execute them. You know it's coming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and actually, it was l legitimate that you said that. Uh, when I've taught, I did a, a, a class on installing LAMP in the cloud. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, new Linux users, and they uh, often that was one of the things they forgot to do was hit enter after they put in the command, and they were wondering. Why I thought they when I think the, I thought the issue people would have doing the lamps is because they didn't have the bulb yet. Yeah. <laughs> no, oh my Michael, uh, you're you're misguiding uh, people. Lamp is Linux, Linux Apache, Apache MySQL, MySQL, and PHP, PHP. together. That's what a lamp is, not the physical lamp you turn the light bulb on, Michael. Oh. Jeez. <laughs> or it could be You would him. think that a a developer a website developer that I used to be would know what that meant. You would think. <laughs> Apparently not. It could be a lamp <laughs> of Linux and Gen X. <laughs> I hate that acronym actually because L the limp is L E M P for yeah. Nginx, which and does not have an E in it. I know, I know, but that's just yeah. Anyway. <laughs> That's, that, that's that's a pet peeve of mine. It is. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. Well, a big thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us by watching or listening to Destination Linux. However you do it, love your faces. Come join us on Discord by going to tuxdigital.com slash Discord. And if you're a patron, there's a super secret room in there for patrons. It's only for patrons where you get the link, the secret link to the show to watch it live. You get to see all of Michael's mistakes. Jill and I, perfect. <laughs> Michael makes mistakes. If you want to catch them, come and watch the live show. You'll see what we're talking about. <laughs> Those happen. I'm not going to deny it. <laughs> <laughs> and also, watching the live show is just one of the awesome perks you get when you become a patron. You also get access to uh, versions of the show without ads, which that's got to be nice. Also, versions of the show unedited, where you can see all the things that Ryan screws up on. And you can also join us in the patron only post show, which happens every week after the show. And you can do all this by going to tuxdigital.com slash membership. Also, if you want to support the network, you can go to tuxdigital.com slash store and get some awesome swag. We have t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, stickers, hats, coasters, and more at tuxdigital.com slash store.
And make sure to check out all the awesome shows here on Text Digital. We have the Pseudo Show, This Week in Linux, the DOS Geek Channel, Linux Out Loud, Hardware Addicts, which is now in video, Linux Saloon, and our newest show, Fit and Fueled. And everyone head to textdigital.com and subscribe to all these great shows. And don't forget to leave a rating on your favorite app so others can discover the power of open source and keep those penguins marching and the full Monty of Linux and open source awesome sauce. Everybody, Everybody have a great week. And remember Wait, what? that the journey Don't you itself. Take my line. It's my <laughs> line. No. The journey itself Bad is just as important as the destination. Bad Jill. Bad Michael. <laughs> Both of you in timeout. <laughs> Sorry, Ryan. You should go then. Everybody have a great week. And remember the journey itself is just as important as the destination. Thanks, everyone. Perfect. You said it so beautifully, Ryan. <laughs> Thank awesome. You. That was awesome, Ryan. We love you. <laughs> oh. Do you remember when you tried to jump in uh, before and you messed me and to take it from yes, me? I was like, I, yeah, no, I'm going to get I, you back. <laughs> it's so frustrating when people do that stuff to you, you know? I mean, I'm going to keep doing it to you, but it's so frustrating. Yeah, of course you will. <laughs> yeah.